Hey, Foundry Church, I am super excited this morning to introduce to you someone who I'm a total fan of. Uh, I was introduced to his book uh, just over a year, about a year and a half ago, by a friend of mine uh, at Larry Osborne's church out in California, and he told me, you got to read Mark Clark's The Problem of God, and I was like, okay. So I got on the plane, I downloaded it, I put my earbuds in, I quit listening when the book was over. And if you know me, I'm a little too ADD to dial it in. Mark is a gifted theologian. I love his voice into culture, into everything regarding who God is and his salvific work through Jesus Christ and the evidence for him in this world. Would you join me in welcoming today Mark Clark as he teaches at Foundry Church? All right, all right. Thank you guys so much. How you doing? Doing good? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks to Eric. Thanks to Eric. God, this is a great staff I've been interacting with. Uh, greetings from Sacramento, California. That's where I live now. But I grew up in Toronto, Canada. So I'm Canadian. Uh, and so uh, the smoke and the fire is our July 4th gift to you. <laughs> Leaving the monarchy. Uh, and so that's our little gift to say, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. So anyways, uh, God bless you guys. Good to be with you. Uh, we're talking about the 60s. We're talking about things that happened. And I was assigned the book of Ephesians. And uh, so if you open up to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter one is where we're gonna be. And uh, rather than giving a full overview of the entire book, I'm gonna hone in on a few important verses right off the top of Ephesians chapter one. Uh, and it probably, probably get to the first two verses. So here's what it says. Paul is writing, as that video talked about, you know, he's writing from prison and he's writing to the Ephesian church and he's kind of laying out who Jesus is, what the mission of Christ is, what this all has to do with our life. So super relevant to what you and I are dealing with in the, uh, the modern era. And he starts out and he says this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he starts out by saying, hey, listen, uh, I'm gonna talk about myself. I'm gonna introduce myself. My name's Paul. So right there, we got to stop and we got to reflect on that. The word Paul, underline it in your Bible because some of you might be sitting here, especially if you're like new to church or exploring Christianity and going, man, Paul must have been like a church going, righteous, perfect guy, you know, sung all the hymns and did his devos every day in Oswald Chambers and never watched rated R movies and tithed to the church and went to the, you know, all awesome. That must have been who Paul was. He must have been a perfect guy because God only uses perfect people. And you're kind of feeling bad about it because you know that you're not a perfect person. You know the, 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 the mistakes you've made, the failures you've done, the sins you've done. And you're like, man, God could never ever use me to do something awesome. And I am here to say to you, that's to misunderstand the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible takes and uses messed up people like you and me to do amazing things. Can I get an amen? I know you're Dutch, but we can say amen once in a while. So here's the deal. Uh, God uses people not because of them, but in spite of them. Here's who the Apostle Paul was. Apostle Paul was responsible for the murder of the first Christian. So he was not someone that we would go, oh man, he was the perfect guy and God only used perfect people. He is the person that you and I could be sitting here right now going, man, God can never use me. And I'm just gonna tell you, I am the poster boy for God could never use me to do anything in life, anything in ministry, anything for Christianity. Uh, I was born, in, I never walked to a church until I was 19 years old. Uh, I was born into a family that was very atheistic. So my father was such an ardent atheist, no Bible, no church, no prayer, no nothing, that my mom wanted to name my brother Matthew. And he said, absolutely not. I think that name's in the Bible. We're not, we're not naming him Matthew. So my mom convinced him, okay, let's name him Matthew, but we'll spell it with one T because that's not the way they spell it in the Bible. So my dad allowed that. So my brother's name is Matthew with one T. But then four years later, they had me and named me Mark. So clearly this guy has never opened up a Bible in his life. Like if I had another brother, be like, Luke, I think Luke's a good name. We should name him Luke, right? So I'm, I, there's no real, I did not grow up in this at all. I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in Christianity. In fact, when my parents got divorced, I was about seven or eight years old. And uh, that psychological trauma, that event, 
caused me to develop something called Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. So as you watch me up here, you'll see like my face twitches around and I, you know, listen, if some of you don't know what Tourette syndrome is, it's a way not to be cool in high school. All right. It's just like you, uh, you do a lot of random habits and twitches with your body and all this stuff. And so uh, I, I had, I had habits where I would like, like it was just what Tourette's, like I would swear at people, right? Like I would just swear randomly, like just the F word, F word, F word. Like I just have to, and I'd have to do it. Like, and I'd be sitting in a big room and it was like, you know, doing a math exam or something with my whole high school, you know, it would be this many people and the room's dead silent for an hour. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like welling up at me like F. All right. And everybody go, ah, there's Mark. Um, and I, like, not the letter F, the word. I, I just, you're, not, you're nice. You're like nice Christian people. So I'm trying to be like, eh. So, uh, so, uh, so I remember, I mean, I, I, went, I spoke at a, at a men's conference uh, a couple months ago. And the guy started, he's like, here's what I want us to do. I want us all to stand and be dead silent for two minutes as the Lord speaks to us. And I'm like, no, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. <laughs> Like, I'm the speaker, I'm front row. I'm like, all I want to do is make a noise or something. So I actually spoke in Seattle uh, a couple, uh, I think it was last year. And uh, I got uh, an email from a woman. She's like, you know, I rarely come to church uh, and I wanted to come back to church. So I started coming back to this church in, in Seattle and, uh, and I got in and God, God was like, hey, you know, I want to use you to speak and encourage people. So don't just show up to church and do nothing. I want you to go and like welcome people and pray with people, talk to people. So she said, I showed up last week and I'm sitting there and there was this homeless guy in the back row and, you know, he's kind of twitching around and making weird noises. I was like, okay, I, you know, I got to go encourage that guy. And, and then I realized like, oh, the song is over. And then the guy got up to introduce the speaker and it was you. I was the homeless guy, <laughs> twitching around like a meth addict in the back row. So she's like, wow, that kind of messed me up, man. That was weird. And, and, and what God does is he takes people like us in all our silliness, in all the mistakes we've made, in all of our brokenness. And he says, look, I'm going to use you, not because of you, but in spite of you. I'm going to use you. You're not special. Paul, you're a murderer. And you're sitting here right now. You're going, yeah, you don't know what I've done, man. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know how I've derailed my family. I'm not gifted. I'm not called. I'm not talented. I'm not good enough. I make way too many mistakes in life. And I'm just telling you here, here here's the last job a guy is going to get who randomly throws F-bombs around. A preacher. It's not going to work, right? Why would God call somebody like me into this? Everyone's going to be confused. It's like rated R to get into the church service. You can't do it. And yet God takes us, not because of us, and in spite of it, but in spite of it. So when I'm uh, 17 years old, a guy named Chris walks into my woodworking class and he tells me about Jesus. And similar to the apostle Paul, I mean, you know, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ. So he's introducing himself. Paul was moving in a completely different direction. He was martyring Christians he was, and Jesus knocked him down, made him blind and said, I'm calling you into something. And when I was 17, God and Chris told me about Jesus. I gave my life to Christ. I spent two years just reading the Bible. I would just sit at high school and read the Bible outside. I smoke my pack of cigarettes, read the Bible tell people about Jesus, right? That's who I was. I didn't know any better. I was two years before I ever walked into church and someone told me I'm not allowed to smoke. And even then it took me five years because I loved it so much. <laughs> you guys are Dutch, you understand that. So it's like, so it's like, man, I wanted to smoke it. So I'm smoking, I'm reading the Bible and telling people about Jesus. I have all these crazy friends. And for two years, I just told people about Jesus. I would baptize people. I was baptizing people in Lake Ontario, all right? Great Lakes, ah? Every California, they don't know what I'm talking about. Lake Ontario, at two o'clock in the morning, I'm baptizing people, tell them about Jesus. People are coming to Christ. It was crazy. And then someone sat me down. So I was gonna, here's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to go into the academic world. I wanted to be a professor. So I was gonna move to Vancouver, and then I was gonna go overseas and do a PhD and become a professor because I love footnotes. All right, footnotes are awesome. Quiet libraries are awesome. Here's what I don't love, people. All right, people are the worst. <laughs> and so footnotes don't cheat on their wives. They don't send dumb emails about the volume of worship and church. 
and that there's not a group for me. And, rah, 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 and I'm like, I don't want to get into that life. So I'm just going to go be a professor. And then when I'm in Vancouver, God goes, no, you're not. I want you to plant a church. And I'm like, oh no. What do you mean plant a church? Yeah, I want you to plant a church right here in Vancouver. Now Vancouver, if you know anything about Vancouver, like, so Canada is already probably 20 years ahead of America in regard to like secularization and post-Christian stuff, right? So, so I like to say to American audiences, I come to you from the future. <laughs> right? Canada is where your country is going in regard to philosophy and worldview. So, so I'm like, okay, I'm in Vancouver, super progressive. All right, so it's like everyone thinks that, oh, they're connected to the universe because they wear Lululemon pants and eat kale and carry a water bottle. So they think that this is my connection to the divine. And, and God's like, I want you to plant a church there. And I'm like, but nobody cares about Jesus. You're like, what am I gonna do? And it's like, just tell them about Jesus. So every, and everyone said, oh, in Canada, you know, you can't get up and like teach the Bible and tell them about the, that they're sinful and tell them that Jesus is their only hope and there's no and such thing as hell. You can't say that. So, so you just have to like, just, just soft sell it. Like, hey, everybody, like you have ideas. I have ideas. We all have ideas. Sorry, right? Like that's, that's really what's going to work. And I was like, that sounds like a terrible church. So I got 16 people in my house and I would just open up the door. Literally, we planted our church, planted elementary school gym. I just started preaching through books of the Bible verse by verse. Like I, it, I was in the gospel of Matthew for three and a half years. Three and a half years. And you can tell at the rate we're going why, right? We're on Paul right now, by the way. The word Paul. If you're like taking notes and you're like, where are we in this sermon? Paul. So three and a half years, I would go through the gospel of Matthew and every single week, I would just look at people and say, your life is a disaster. You are a wreck. You are sinful, pitiable, poor, blind, naked, wretched. I can't believe you even got here and you're functional, but don't worry because Jesus is the hero of your life. You are not the hero of your life. Jesus is the hero of your life. And all these Canadians would go, oh my gosh, this is so offensive. I'm gonna go get my friend, all right? And they'd go get their friend and their friend would come to know Jesus and they'd get off their addictions and their marriages would get healed and their kids would turn out. And this thing started to happen where the church started to grow and grow and grow. And these, these 50 people became 200 people, became 300 people. And then, you know, similar to Foundry Church, man. I was like, we're sitting in his high school gym. I said, what are we gonna do? It's rammed, no more space. And then someone came to like, you're gonna have to go to two services, bro. I'm like, oh no, the dreaded two services. So I'm like, shoot. So now I'm gonna have to preach twice. It's twice as much work. These people aren't giving, bunch of losers, but I'm gonna have to do it anyway. So I got up and I'm like, look. And this, I remember this lady walked up to me. She's like, we should not go to two services. I said, why? She's like, this is gonna be the nail in our coffin, man. I'm like, why? We're in a coffin right now? I understand how we're in a coffin. We're growing. She's like, no, no, no. Because church is about community. And I got to meet with Sandra and we got to be able to go for lunch after. And now we're going to be at two services. And Sandra, which service are you going to? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, listen, I got up the next Sunday. I said, listen, we're going to two services because I didn't start a church so that you could get more friends. I started a church because every day people die and go to hell. People like my father who passed away when I was 15 years old, didn't know Jesus. And that's why I started this church. I don't care what church you go to, but we're going to two services next week. And, and we went to two services next week and we grew by 50 people in a week just by, well, she left. So 49 people. <laughs> we grew by 49 people in a week just by going to two services. That's crazy. And then this thing just started to go and there was nothing I could do to stop it. And this is what happens when the spirit, I mean, if you look down later in, in verse 13, he says, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When the spirit of God starts to pour out and do stuff, as he did in the apostle Paul's life, you can't even keep up with it. We did this event uh, every year at Village, this is the church I started up in Vancouver, where uh, we would go out to this park and we would just do the ch whole church service in a public park. It was called uh, Church in a Park. And, and, and we <laughs> took our creatives like two months to name that. Um, so Church in the Park, we used to do that. 
and thousands of people would gather and then we do baptisms. So I tell people about Jesus and then we do baptisms. And I remember a few years ago, we were all lined up and we had like 30 baptisms signed up. So we're preaching in the park. And by the end of the day, 96 people had been baptized on a single day. We're talking about the West Coast of Canada. It's not supposed to happen. 96 people. You had grandmothers walking up there, 89 years old, terminally ill in her Sunday best, just planned to come to church. She's in the tank with me going, I never realized I needed to give my life to Jesus and get baptized and publicly go. I got a guy in there. He's like, dude, my girlfriend and I, we just got, we were hammered last night. We crashed on my buddy's couch and we were walking home and we're like, what's this in the park? And so we just walked up and we heard about Jesus. And now we want to give our life to Jesus. And I'm in the tank with him. I'm like, you're still hung over. I don't even think this is legitimate. I'm like, oh, go, go. <laughs> the guy, what are you doing here? Because this is what God does. He, t- he does things, even if like, like there were times when, I remember one particular Sunday, one particular weekend, uh, I was in a very bad, like, like just emotionally, I was drained, man. I was preaching four services and all these campuses and all this staffing and all this stuff you got to do. And I was just kind of tired. And I was like sitting like backstage, ready to go out and preach. And I was just sitting there in my Bible. I'm like, I don't even feel like preaching to these people. Like, I know you guys have never experienced that in your life. But as a pastor, sometimes I would look out on my crowd and just be like, bro, I know you, you sit in the same seat every week. You've never brought a friend. I look out at you. I know you don't give anything either. So I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking in general. My, my church, not you guys. <laughs> And I was just frustrated with my church. I'm like, I don't even care. So I like went out and preached like a, like a Jonah. You know, Jonah, when he, you know, God's like, I want you to go save the Ninevites and he doesn't like any of the Ninevites. So he just goes and preaches like the worst sermon. And that's what I did. I just went out and I'm like, I don't know. God hates you, figure it out. You know, it was like, <laughs> you know, and then I was done, man. I just went home, whatever. And uh, we had this like admin meeting on Tuesday. And the girl comes in, she's like, uh, we're going to have to figure something out here. I don't know what you said on Sunday, but we had more people give their life to Jesus on Sunday than we've ever had. People were standing up and they were walking up to ushers and going, can you please lead me to Christ? And the usher's like, a uh, bucket, right? They're like, <laughs> they had never been trained to lead anyone to Jesus. They'd only been trained to hand out the buckets and take the offering. So then we had to start a training program for everybody that was on site to lead somebody. Listen, this is the kind of stuff that happens. None of this has to do with me. It's all in spite of me. That's the point. It's that when the spirit of God starts to move, there's nothing you can do to stop him. And people start getting their life transformed and then it becomes addicting. And then other people want a piece of it because they're like, well, I know you used to be like this and now you're like this. I want to know what the difference is. And Paul's going, man, this is the difference that has happened in my life. And so look at even what he's saying about it being like he, an apostle of Christ Jesus, an apostle. That word means to be a sent one, which means he was a missionary, which means he left everything that was neat and comfortable in his life and he went out. And he went to jail and he got shipwrecked and he got beaten. I mean, this is the spirit of Christianity. And then we've made it safe for the whole family. Christianity's not safe. It's like this raw, like I remember when I first became a Christian, it was raw. I was reading the New Testament, everyone's getting their head cut off. I was like, man, when I finally do enter a church, it's going to be crazy. It's just going to be raw. It's going to be real. It's going to be authentic. I'm going to go in. We're going to be singing about the death of Christ. It's going to be like, sit down, shut up. It's going to be flares and whips. It's going to be raw. <laughs> and I walked in, man, and it was like, hi, hi, hi. Hey, everyone, potlucks. And I was like, what the crap is going on right now? I'm like, I'm reading the New Testament. Everyone's jacked up and dead. And I come to church and it's like, there was, on the worship slides, there was birds sucking pollen out of flowers. And everyone's like, oh, isn't that so nice? Come on out. It was safe for the whole family. And I'm like, I don't even recognize this. This domesticated version of Christianity. Where are the barbarians? Where are the sacrificial people? the people willing to to die for this thing. I don't even recognize it in this church I was in because everything was safe. 
You said safe things, you did safe things, you sang safe songs, everything was safe. And I was like, I don't, I don't even understand this. Because G, you, you wanna know, you wanna know where the action is? I, see, I can almost guarantee you something. Some of you are bored with Christianity. You're bored with it. You know why you're bored with it? Because you're not actually living out Christianity. You're living out a domesticated, Americanized version of Christianity that was fed you. If you're bored with Christianity, let me ask you to do something this afternoon. Go to a Starbucks, sit in the Starbucks and pray and ask God to share something with you about a stranger that's sitting in Starbucks and then walk up to them and say, here's what God told me about you. Now, all of a sudden, you're not so bored. Because you got to live on the edge. That's where the fruit is. And so we're all like, okay, how do I, how do I, Apostle Paul's going, I'm an apostle. I'm a sent one. I'm on mission. I want you to join me. So that's what he sends to Ephesus. Because here's the beautiful thing. When we start to recognize that, we begin to realize the church is not a country club. It's a hospital. For broken, messed up sinners, just like you, and I love to tell my church all the time, you're a bunch of morons. And that's biblical. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter one, Paul says, God is gonna use the foolish things of the world. And the, I took Greek for three years and this is what I got out of it. The Greek word for fool is moron. <laughs> and that's exactly what you actually have to start to live into. Is you don't have it all together. So let's stop pretending. The apostle Paul is just stripped bare. He's going, this is who I am. And I'm writing to you in Ephesus. And then he says a very important word. He says, um, but, uh, uh, the apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The will of God is just a fascinating thing. One of the big things that we always try to figure out is how, what is the will of God for my life? How do I find the will of God for my life? Very difficult thing. Paul's going, man, I know one thing. I'm called to be an apostle. All the other details, I have no idea. This is exactly what's true about us. You and I live in a culture where we think God is supposed to tell us every single detail. Who am I gonna marry? What is their name? And then we start looking in the alphagetti soups or whatever to try to figure out who, you know, we start looking for the signs, right? As if God is gonna go, Sarah, marry Sarah, right? It's not. And here's why we do that. We get very confused because we think God is supposed to tell us the name of the person we're supposed to marry. You go back 200 years and you go to the small villages that we all came from, you know who you married? One of the 12 girls in your village that wasn't your sister. <laughs> Those were your options. Now we live in a situation of what's called the paralysis of choice. We have so many choices, we don't know what to do. Because you could just flip, flip, flip. You know, younger generation, you know, you're on the apps. You have an endless amount of people you could marry. You get on a Christian mingle dating app, you're just boom, 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 boom. Baseball, baseball, likes Ohio State, screw them. Go, 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 <laughs> go, go. And you're constantly trying to look for something that you're gonna connect to because you have an endless amount of possibilities. And so you feel like that in life. I don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. And he goes, listen, I'm not gonna tell you the name of the person you're supposed to marry. Here's what I am gonna tell you. Serve them like Christ served the church. I'm not gonna tell you the city that you're gonna live in, in the magical clouds. What I'm gonna tell you is whatever city you end up in, serve it like Jesus serves you. And so he says this beautiful word then, he says to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, he says verse two, grace to you and peace. So, so underline, double click, highlight, circle, the word grace. Because you and I have to start to understand this concept is the thing that changes our lives, grace. You know what grace means? Undeserved favor. If you live in a religious system, you think that you can earn your favor in front of God. The gospel comes along and says, there's nothing you can do to earn your favor in front of God. I don't care how much money you give. I don't care how often you go to church. I don't care if you do your devos every day. There is nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is only by grace, which means it's undeserved which means now you can just live in all the mistakes and the failures you've made. Even as a pastor, I make them all the time. The amount of mistakes and things that I've fumbled to this day. I was on a, a plane coming back from Orange County. We were on a big staff and elder retreat in Orange County, about an hour flight from Sacramento. And um, we're on the plane, the whole board's there, the staff. So a board member and his wife are sitting in front of me. I'm behind them and I'm watching her interact with the person that's flying with them. And I keep hearing the word Jesus. And this board member's wife just keeps talking to us, Jesus, Jesus, I'm like, this is fascinating. Halfway through the flight, she turns around, she's like, Pastor Mark, I want you to meet this girl. 
I just met her on the plane. She just gave her life to Jesus. And I want her to meet you. And I'm like, what? You know, this is incredible. So I meet this girl and they're celebrating with her. You know what I was doing for that hour flight? Watching She-Hulk. <laughs> Why am I a pastor? When I first started our church, we were outside of Vancouver. We lived in a, uh, an Asian community. And I was like, we started our church. I'm like, we got to start reaching out. So I walked up to a guy, about 100 people. I said, dude, I want you to start a Chinese speaking community group. You're going to kill it. You're going to slay it. Huge Chinese community. Got to reach him. He's like, yeah, Mark, great idea. Awesome. Uh, but I'm Korean. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I know. I know, I'm just saying, I think you'd be good at it. What are you talking about? So the worst day of my life, six months before I plant Village, um, was the day I told a woman that her husband was dead and I had the wrong guy. Yeah, that actually happened to me. I had gone to a hospital visit on Friday, went back on uh, Monday on my way to work and I walked in this guy's room and I looked and I saw him and he was dead. And I was like, oh, and then the nurse, before I walked around the thing, grabbed me by the shoulder. She said, can I help you, sir? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for a visit, pastoral visit. And I'm here for the family. And she said, okay, no, I'm sorry. He passed away this morning. Now, if you're taking notes about how to do pastoral visits, when someone says uh, he passed away this morning, say, Who? But I didn't, and I'm like, okay, well, I guess Dave's dead. And so I drove back to the office, and I told the secretary, I said, oh, Dave's dead. She's like, okay, marked it down, went on with my day, until Dave's wife, like two hours later, walked into the church office holding a Subway bag with a, with a you know, Subway sandwich in it. And she said to the secretary, I'm going, I'm going to visit Dave. And so the secretary runs back to my office. She's like, she's going to visit. I don't think she knows. And I'm like, what? How, what do you mean she doesn't know? I saw the doctor. She was on the phone. Oh my goodness, okay, we'll, we'll send her back here. I'll tell her. So she comes back in the office. It's a true story. I look at her and I said, hey, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dave's dead. At which point she passes out into my arms. And then I just sit her down. I'm like, hey, let me go get you some water. Go get some water. And we go in and we talked for an hour and we mourned Dave's death. I mean, she went through all the grieving stages. We started planning his funeral. And then I walked out to get a cup of coffee and I heard the secretary say something about a different hospital. I'm like, hold up. Dave was in this hospital, right? They're like, no, no, they moved him on Saturday. What? So I'm like, I need to hear from Dave. <laughs> like pronto. So secretary called the hospital. Yeah, yeah, Dave's here. He's sitting up chatting with people. He's waiting for his lunch. Chill out. I'm like, what? So I walked back into the room with his wife in it. Hey. Hey. So remember that thing we were talking about? She's like, I, you know, I've, I've kind of wrestled it. I get it. I'm going to see him again, you know, at the resurrection of the dead. I'm like, actually, you're going to see him a little earlier than that because I had the wrong guy. And I'll never forget the look on her face. And in that moment, I'll tell you this, Satan used that in my life to discourage me and tell me something. He told me a lie. He said, if you plant a church, you will ruin a lot of people's lives. So you shouldn't do it. Give up. You're acting like a grown up, and you're actually just a kid. And I needed people to come around me and preach what? Grace. I needed people to come around me and go, oh, you thought you were gonna plant a church because you're perfect and you're never gonna mess up and you're never gonna make a mistake. Oh, because, because you're good. No, 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 no. We're gonna plant a church and reach people for Jesus because he's good. And so when you begin to wonder about that in your life, you can go, man, who are the kinds of people God uses? I remember when I showed up at church, I'd been smoking since the time I was in grade eight. So I came to church. One of the hardest things I ever did was quit smoking. I was a Christian for like eight years. I loved it. And I was like, man, and I remember a guy, the pastor had preached a sermon that Sunday on not being 
unequally yoked. Like you're not supposed to, you know, uh, uh, date a non-Christian. And a guy walked up to my girlfriend at the time, who, Aaron, she goes on to be my wife, and walked up to her and said, you're not allowed to date Mark anymore. And she said, why? He said, well, I, I saw him smoking out in front of the church. That means he's not a Christian. And uh, she's like, well, what was he smoking? <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you mean? He's smoking cigarettes. She's like, well, it's better than what he used to smoke. <laughs> and that's the thing. Because never look at where somebody is. Look where they came from. Where are they where are they in the progression? Where are they in their life of transformation and sanctification? Not who are they right now and I'll judge everything about them because this is a hospital, not a country club. This is a place where we can come and actually need the grace of Jesus in our life and have other people show it to us. Listen to the people that God used in the Bible. I saw this meme the other day. It said this, Noah got drunk. Abraham was too old. Abraham pimped out his wife twice. Go read the story, <laughs> right? One, one writer I read said, we won't even let you be a greeter. You do stuff like that. <laughs> Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob lied. Leah was ugly. Says she was weak about the eyes. That's the Hebrew way of going... <laughs> <laughs> Joseph was abused. Moses was a murderer and couldn't talk. Gideon was afraid. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was an adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. <laughs> Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha was worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was a murderer. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. Like you got one step up at least on Lazarus. And here's what grace starts to do. It starts to go, God can use any of you. No matter what your past is. And here's the other thing grace does. It never lets you then compare yourself to anybody else. You don't have to, God has you and he's given you the experiences, the history, the past, the gifting that he's given you. And you're not supposed to compare yourself to anybody. Comparison is the one thing that is toxic to your contentment in life. Think about your marriage. If you go around and compare yourself and compare your spouse to every other spouse in the world, are you gonna be content in life? No, because you just have an endless amount of people you can scroll. And you can scroll and you go, oh man, Sarah, she's really keeping herself up. I don't know what's with my wife, just kind of, you know, whatever, since we got married, just really doesn't pay attention to this kind of stuff. Man, it'd be nice to have a wife like Sarah. You could do that all day, man. You just scroll, scroll the internet. You know, the ladies scroll. Man, Tom seems to take his family to Hawaii every six months. And I'm married to Joe over here sitting on the couch, potatoes all over him. Never been, never been to Hawaii in my life. Man, I wish I'm married to go like Joe, a guy like Joe, man. And you start to compare and you compare. You realize Adam and Eve in the garden had no one but each other. Eve was Adam's value. All he had, it was either Eve or zebra. <laughs> Those were his options. And that's exactly how you're supposed to live. In a way that once you get married, my wife becomes the absolute standard of beauty and I don't go scrolling around. And it's the same thing with women. So it's like when God goes, don't compare yourself to anybody else. Don't compare yourself. I remember the first church I ever joined. They were like, we're going to fit you into a mold. This is how you're supposed to be a pastor. This is how you're supposed to preach. And they're like, this is how we do sermons. We do, a jo every sermon starts with a joke. So you got to get up there. You got to work on your joke. And you got to tell a joke to start the sermon. I'm like, I don't, that's really not my style. I don't, it's going to feel really weird. And they're like, nope. You tell a joke to start. I'm like, all right. So the first time I ever preached there, I was like, all right, so two Jews and a hooker walk into a bar and I'm <laughs> And they're like, yeah, no, you know what? Don't do that anymore. We're good. Just you do you. We don't need you to be like the senior pastor here. It seems to be a bit of a disconnect. 
And this is exactly what God does. He saves you from trying to be anything else. I don't want to be Eric. I don't want to be Erica. I don't want to be any, I want to be what God has made me to be. And whatever I can do in life to let people, to give them permission to be broken, to depend on the grace of God versus feeling like they have to be perfect. Look at what he says then, grace to you and peace. What does he say? He calls God what? God our Father. Such an interesting image of Father. You get, like, okay, so I live, you guys heard of Folsom Prison? Folsom Prison? So the only thing I knew about Folsom Prison before moving to Sacramento was Folsom Prison Blues, you know, Johnny Cash, all that. So I live 20 minutes from Folsom Prison. So we have a campus, we have a church campus in Folsom Prison. So every Sunday, they watch our sermons online or on the, on the screen. We have a pastor there. We are connected. Every Sunday, we say, hey, Folsom Prison guys, blah, blah, blah. So in October, we went and did a conference there. So we show up to this conference in Folsom Prison. I'm like nervous because I've never been to prison before. And as you can see, I wouldn't do well. Uh, and so we're like waiting outside to go in. And then like the guy comes on the microphone and he's like, hey, we have a, you know, chill out everybody. There's been a stabbing in the prison. Some guy got shanked. Everyone chill. I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's the day, right? We're calling it. Like we're not going in there. And they're like, no, no, that's just a 10 minute delay. We're good. And I see a guy come out in a gurney. He's like all shaking. I'm like, what? I think we should just not go. I don't know. And they're like, no, we're doing it. So we go in and I'm like, hopefully there's like screens, you know, hopefully I'm on a stage. There's like a glass wall or something when I preach to these guys. Cause you know, it's prison, man. This isn't like I, you know, stole from a 7-Eleven once. This is like murders and stuff in there. So it was like, all right, gate opens. And it was like, just like watching Shawshank. Like you just walk in. I'm like, oh my goodness. And the guys are there. And they're like, I'm right in general population. And they're like working out. <laughs> they got all their tattoos. Like it was exactly like the movies. And they're like looking at me like, what's up? I'm like, sup. <laughs> so I'm like just trying to be top of my, then I walk in and I thought, oh, they get, they slam this gate behind us. We go into the chapel and there's 300 guys in jumpsuits. And this guy walks right up to me. And I'm like, is there going to be like a security guard beside me? No. Guys walks right up, like walks right at me. I'm like, ugh. And he just looks at me, he gives me the biggest hug I've ever been given in my life. And he looks at me, he just goes, how are Aaron and the kids? And I'm like, you know my family? <laughs> <laughs> and I started preaching to these guys and they were the most grace-filled, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving group of dudes I've ever been around in my life. And I preached prodigal son to them. And when I got to the part about the father runs out to the son, I told him the story about a missionary friend I knew in the Philippines who preached that story. And all the elders of the village were lined up in the front. And when they got to that part in the story, all the, all the village elders started looking down and they couldn't look up and they couldn't look up. So after he was done, he looked at one of the village elders and he said, why were you guys looking down on the ground? And he said, because of a son, if a kid in our village had ever gone to their father and asked for their inheritance and run off, if he ever came back, we'd beat him to death. And this father runs out to the son and grabs him and puts his own robe on him and his own shoes and his own ring and says, I want to have a party. And I looked at those guys in Folsom Prison and I said, how many of you raise your hand if your father left your home when you were a kid, abandoned you, were an alcoholic, all the best? How many of you basically don't have a father? Every hand went up. And I was able to look at them and say, right here, in Jesus Christ, you get a father who will never leave you. You get a father who will never drink too much. You get a father who will never abandon you. He will love on you and throw a party for you, even if you sin and you sin and you sin again. And then he ends this whole passage off and he says, God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If we haven't talked about Jesus, it's not a sermon yet. If we haven't talked about not only Jesus as example, but as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, you have to tell people that they're sinful that they'll, so that they'll ever want to fly to Jesus. Because what is it about Jesus? It's about his life and his death and his resurrection. That's the only thing that actually saves you. And that's why Paul starts a whole book of that. He goes, I want you guys for the next six chapters, I want you to know what the most important thing, 
Jesus Christ on high is the one who lived a perfect life in your body, died on the cross, rose again for your salvation, and you got to give your life to him. Your whole life isn't about you. It's about him. And as Tim Keller says, there's only two ways you can read the Bible. You can read the Bible if it's about you, or you can read the Bible as if it's about him. And the example he gives is, if you read the David and Goliath story, think about your devos in the morning. If you're sitting there with your coffee on a Wednesday morning and you're doing your devotions and you read the David and Goliath story, you could read it like, man, if I could just be brave like David, I could slay the giants of my life. And Tim Keller says, and if you read the Bible like that, it will crush you every time because you know you're not David. You know who you are in that story? You're the Israelites hiding up in the forest, terrified, not doing anything. And what you needed was a representative Israelite named Jesus to go down into the valley and fight the battle of Satan, sin, and death, and then impute it to you, even though you did nothing. That's how you read the Bible. And once you start reading it like that, everything changes. Like when you're doing your devotions and you're reading the gospels and Jesus is hanging out with all these people, who are you every time you read the Bible? When you're reading Jesus, who are you? you're always Jesus, right? He's hanging out with the prostitutes and you're like, yeah, you know, I hang out with the prostitutes at work, these spiritual, emotional prostitutes who don't know Jesus and I'm gonna minister to them and my neighbors and whatever. No, 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 you're the prostitute. When Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors, you're not Jesus, you're the tax collector. You are so cheap, you hoard all your money and keep it secure for yourself because you're terrified about what tomorrow might bring. You're the tax collector. You're the Pharisee who's too religious to be able to hear the word. You're not Jesus in the story. Jesus is Jesus. And you need him to work on you and your heart. That's how you end up reading the Bible. That's the way it actually changes you is we begin to realize that it's about Jesus, not us. And that proclamation, why Paul starts with it in verse three is the thing that changes everything. Because here's what it says. What, what is chapter six of Ephesians about? The end of this book. Chapter six is about demons, Satan, principalities and powers, all that stuff. Why does Paul end it that way? And why would he start it this way? Because here's what he's trying to say. Um, a, a, a preaching mentor of mine, he's 76 years old. He lives in Vancouver. I always remember him looking at me and he said this question. If you showed up on Sunday and nobody came to church, there wasn't one person there. You had prepped a sermon and you showed up and you got behind the desk and not one person showed up. It was too smoky or everyone left or whatever. He said, what would you do? And I said, I don't know, I'd go home. And he's like, I wouldn't. He said, I would preach the sermon because the principalities and powers need to hear that Jesus Christ is on the throne. Amen. The prince, there is still an audience in this room, even if you're not sitting here. And the principalities and the powers and the demo, these things need to know that they don't win in the end. Jesus reigns and rules. And this is why Paul's going, I want your whole life to just be about this. I want your whole life to be about Jesus. Now, some of you are sitting here like, Mark, I don't even know what you've been talking about half the time, but here's the deal. I'm a skeptic. I don't believe in any of this stuff. I don't even believe in God. And let me, let me trace you back to that worst day of my life. And I'll end with this. So two or three weeks after I had told that woman that her husband was dead and I had the wrong guy, and I was doubting my whole calling in life, the senior pastor of our church, the church we planted out of, walked into my office and he said these words, I was just praying in my office and God impressed it upon my heart that you're supposed to go to that woman's house and apologize to her. So I need you to find the address book of the, of the woman and go visit her at her house. And I'm like, okay, cool, great idea. Never done that before. Seems kind of weird, but uh, I'll do it probably, you know, great, I'll do it. And I said, I'll probably do it next week. He goes, no, 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 you're supposed to go today. And I'm like, okay, sure. So, you know, put it off, put it off, put it off. I'm like, finally, okay, great, I'll go. So I go in the afternoon. I find this lady's address and I pull up to her house. And I see that her car is in the driveway. So I know she's home and I'm knocking for like 10 or 15 minutes and no one's, no one's answering the door. So finally, 
she, I, you know, I wait, I wait, I wait. And finally, she opens the door, and she's wearing pajamas. It's like 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and she's wearing pajamas. And she goes, what do you want? I'm not her favorite person at this point. And I said, uh, look, I just felt like I needed to come here and apologize to you for, obviously, a huge mistake I made. I'm new to ministry. I'm really sorry. And she goes, do you want to come in? I said, sure. So I went in. And she made some tea, and I sat down in her living room, and we started to chat. And we became buds. Three hours, we're talking theology and this and that. Had a good time and had some tears and prayed. And, and then I got up to leave and I walked to the front door. And she said, do you want to know why I'm in my pajamas at two or three in the afternoon? Still? I'm like, sure. And she said, because this last three weeks of my life have been so emotionally messed up that I walked down the stairs today and told the Lord, I am going to take my own life today. Unless you send someone to the front door to encourage me, I fell asleep on the chair in my living room and woke up to the sound of you knocking on the door. If you don't believe in God, man, he is hunting you down. He's moving. Apostle Paul, you realize... He wasn't like, oh, sign me up. I want to be an apostle. He was going off and doing his own thing. Jesus made him blind, knocked him around and said, now I want you to do this. And some of you, you need to get knocked around by Jesus and wake up to your calling and go, he's calling me to something. I was going in a completely different direction and now he's calling me to do this. And I thought I wasn't good enough, but I'm exactly the person that he's trying to get attention. I'm exactly the person he's going to use for the task that he has put together for me to do. And when you start to understand your identity in light of the personal work of Jesus, nothing can affect you, not even death. Paul says in Philippians, to die is what? Gain. The one thing that everyone else around you is afraid of, you don't have to be if you're in Jesus. And your identity becomes so solid, you don't get to compare yourself to anybody anymore. You can just run with the power of Jesus knowing you're probably not even gonna make as many mistakes as I make on the weekly but he's going to use you to do something. So Father, I do pray that for all of us sitting here, we would first take grace on ourselves because some of us are beating ourselves up so much because we have trouble believing the gospel is true. And so we keep trying to top it up. We keep trying to believe that if we can just be moral and good and right, then maybe you'll love us more. But if we are in Christ, that's the love. That's the identity. There's nothing to add to it. And I pray that once that starts to settle in, that we start to walk in a kind of freedom where we don't care what people think of us because we know what you think of us. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And that we would walk in that kind of freedom that we'd be better spouses, better workers, better business owners, better teachers, better pastors, whatever our role in life is, that we'd be better because we're living in the kind of freedom that that identity creates in us. Let us really believe it and let it change not only what we do, but what we want to do. This is a special church. And I pray that you would use us collectively to affect this city in a way where people look and go, there's something different about how they live. They're not trying to earn it. They're not trying to live for God. They're, they're living from him. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.